Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined back by my old friend, Mr. Dan Garza, to talk about Peisty Symbols. Dan, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. It's good to be back. It's been a long yes, time. Yes, you're my pi- you're my Peisty guy. Uh, we had a two-parter on the history of Peisty before, which was a really, really cool episode. It was before we did video, so uh, people have heard you before. Now we get to see you in your, if you're on YouTube, you can see his awesome collection of, uh, some of his collection um, of Peisty symbols behind you. Um, so Dan, as you know, this episode today is about uh, kind of a guide for like how to get into collecting vintage Peisty symbols. And if you're already into it, then maybe you can get some more info about your collection and dating them and all that good stuff. So this is a cool one. You've done a ton of work. So first off, I appreciate you doing all this work and, and being here, man. Sure. Sure. Labor of love. <laughs> Labor of love. Well, Peisty needs some more. Uh, there's plenty of people who love Peisty, but I think Peisty could use some more like public facing uh, information. It's it's it pales yes. in comparison to the other the Zildjian and Sabian and all that stuff. So, yes, we can help out today. Um, all right, Dan, before we start, before we jump in, um, this has been, it's a good thing. I, I'm very happy to say I have a new upper tier Patreon level uh, member, which if you join the $15 a month patron uh, tier, you get a shout out on the podcast. And I want to give a big thank you to Mr. Kevin Turpin, uh, who's a super nice guy and reached out to me and said, how can I support the show? I, this was after the Neil uh, Peart series. And um, I said, well, Kevin, here's some options. And he immediately joined at the upper tier Kevin's not really plugging anything like a shop or a podcast or a band or anything, which people can do if you join that level. He just told me that he is a um, very longtime drummer of 50 years that he has been playing. And uh, to me, that means a lot to get that kind of, uh, you know, accolade from someone who, who's willing to give some money to the show uh, who's been playing that long because yeah. he's been around the block, obviously, and it means a lot. And it certainly helps the show. Thank you to Kevin Turpin. If people want to join in and uh, help and get your shout out on the show, go to patreon.com slash drum history podcast and join up there. So all that being said, Dan, so why don't we jump in real quick and uh, hear about your background, about what got you into Peisty symbols and led to this uh, immense knowledge that you have. Really the more, the history part started with the pandemic. Um, But this goes back I would say about 45 years. Uh, I started playing uh, drums in 1978 when I was about 13, but I was influenced by two guys, boys at that point. I, I was 13. Uh, there were two other two other boys in my neighborhood that played the drums, and they were about three or four years older than me, and they were already in junior high. Well, I was in elementary school. I was in sixth grade. Um, one of them, this was probably about 77. This is about a year before I started playing. Um, he had just got Song of the Same by Zeppelin. And I vividly remember him opening up the album. Obviously, it's a double album, right? Because it's vinyl back then. And he's thumbing through the photos, and he points a picture of Bonham, and it's that famous picture where Bonham has his mouth open. And it's kind of a close-up, but you could see his 18-inch crash, and you could see the Peisty logo. And you can also see his Tom. So he points to the drums, he says, hey, man, look, his drums are clear. They're orange, but they're clear. <laughs> you know, and my little 12-year-old, like, fragile, childlike, eggshell mind was completely just hard-boiled. And then he points wow. at the cymbal, and he goes, look, man, he plays paste cymbals, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I'm just like, little, I already have long hair. I'm like, whoa, that's totally <laughs> radical. No way. That's totally yeah. radical, man. Yeah. So I had the influence of these guys early on. There was also an older kid who was in high school who would bring albums over like every week and my dad had a pretty decent stereo which is nice and i had a brother who was older year older and we listened to the same music and this guy would bring these albums over and this was like 77 maybe late 76 77 78 and he brings this album over he's like hey look at this man 2112 i'm like whoa what's that and I open it up, and I'm looking at the pictures. I'm like, "No way, they're wearing robes, man. That's totally rude. That's that's radical." I'm like, "That guy's name is Getty. No way." Yeah. So that was my introduction to Rush, and then he brings over Yes songs. Then he brings over Emerson, like a Palmer live wow. triple album. You know, cool and I'm like, "Yeah." 
<laughs> well, the guy's like 17. It, it was it's this huge introduction to, you know, classic rock when it was happening. Um, yeah. I moved back east uh, in 79, and I got my first Pisces for Christmas, December 79. It was a 16-inch 404. And because the two boys in my neighborhood already got 404s in 78, to me, that those were the symbols. I, 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 by then, I knew who Zildjian was because I had taken drum lessons for a short period of time. Oddly enough, at Mel, Zil, Mel Zilnick's Music Stop in Canoga Park, which is where Freddie Gruber taught. But oh, wow. I missed him by about a year. He started teaching there about a year after I took lessons there. At any mm. rate, um, yes, that was my first, uh, my first Pisces symbol. Wow. Unbelievable. And as you said before, that the pandemic and things got you into the history. And uh, I mentioned it before, but if, if, if you're listening to this and you are interested in the history of the company, then you need to check out the first two episodes I did with Dan, which dig deep into that history, because we're not going to be really going into that as much with the family and all that stuff. We would be oh, I mean, we did two long parts. We actually yeah. recorded one twice and because we wanted to do it better. And that was a that was a fun one with you. But um, link in the description per usual for that stuff. But um, so, Dan, this is a long uh, you sent me an outline with a ton of information here. So let's just maybe I know you have an objective section here, which I think is a yeah. great way to kind of just start and tell people what it's like, you know, the thesis statement, like, what are we going to learn? And let's just do that. <laughs> and uh, and I know you have some thank yous and some people you want to mention along yes. the way. So let's just jump into this and talk about the guide to collecting vintage Peisty symbols. Okay. Yeah. If I could start with the thanks, let's get that out of the way. Um, a lot has happened. I think it's been over, over a year and a half since you and I did those episodes and I've learned so much. Um, number one on my list has to be number one is Fritz Steger, or I like to call Mr. Fritz, who turns out we're the same age. Uh, we're both drummers. We both group listen to the same music, but his just overwhelming amount of knowledge that he has about Pisces, the company, and also the family. Uh, he also really exposed me to um, the, the German and European drum and cymbal industry, which I knew nothing about. Uh, he had been in the business for decades. So he even wrote a book about European drums. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to get it published, but he did, he did write it, you know, so he's done an enormous amount of research. Um, sure. Second, a close second has got to be Steve Black because he gave me keys to the wiki. He gave me keys to this hot rod and let me take it for a ride. So, <laughs> and he's given me free reign for two years. Um, next, again, a huge thank you is Todd Little. And the reason why Todd is so important I don't know how he does this, but he literally will comb through online library archives and he will find advertisements out of uh, like periodicals from like the early 1960s or even late 1950s, like Downbeat Magazine. He'll find these advertisements and since they're dated, he, he knows when the symbols were advertised. So, that, so from that evidence, we could tell, okay, they were producing these symbols at least by this date. Um, another big thank you is to Daniel Plasco. Daniel Plasco has an amazing collection of symbols, mostly sound creations and, and 602 blue lab labels. But he's helped me a lot with contacts in Europe, where to buy, uh, valuing symbols. He's really good at that. Um, but most importantly with Daniel, he had the balls to approach Freddie Studer and say, hey, I have a friend who would like to talk to you. And he set up the interview, the chance for me to interview Freddie last, mm -hmm. last spring a lot, and last summer. And I spent about two months corresponding with Freddie and I spoke with Freddie two days before he passed away. And it was absolutely just heartbreaking because he, Freddie was really kind of like the last, besides Eric, he's really the last guy that but he was there, you know, I mean, he was there yeah. in 1970. So, wow. you know, um, moving yeah. on, uh, my friend Nils Lillig, my Berlin connection, uh, fantastic guy, fantastic drummer. He has really helped me with the German market, uh, pricing what, what, what is valuable, what he thinks is valuable. 
He also exposed me to Stambul 65s, which I'd never even heard of before, which we'll talk about later. Uh, he's also a big fan of 404s and 505s. And he's got the largest collection of Stambul 65s, I think, on the planet. Um, wow. I don't know anybody else. I mean, I've he showed me his list several times, and he's got an amazing collection. And last mm-hmm. but not least is Big JD, John DeChristopher. And... There's several reasons why I want to thank him. One, because he's just a great guy, but he's also really, he's really introduced me to the Zildjian culture and, and, and learning a lot more about the company, especially really the people. Um, and he does great podcasts. Um, most Absolutely. importantly, most importantly and, and this is a little story unto itself, I found out recently talking to him, because we, we go back and forth all the time. And by the way, he's a Pisces player. He does play Pisces symbols, and he just bought two <laughs> brand new 2002 thing crashes a few months ago. So nice. That's he's just maxing out my respect o meter. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. he, was a v, he was a VP of Zoom, his, and, and he's not yeah. afraid to to play Pisces. I mean, dude. Anyways, yeah. um, so when I was saying earlier, my introduction uh, playing at drums. When we, uh, we moved back east. Um, and we'll get into more about distribution availability. Pisces in Massachusetts was Zildjian country, and it was really hard to find Pisces. And the, the, the place that had Pisces symbols was Boston. Downtown Boston was E. Wurlitzer. And that's where I bought my first Black Label 2002 and my first two Red Label 2002s in 80 and 81 and 82. And then six, eight months ago or something, I'm online you know, chatting with, with uh, 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 John DeChristopher's on, on the DFL forum. And he mentions that he worked for EU Wurlitzer. And I messaged him and I said, hey, you know, I bought symbols there. And we went back and forth. And I'm like, dude, you sold me those symbols in like 1981. <laughs> you know, it's wow, like small this, world. Yeah. You know, so yeah. it's like there was out of the I mean, I used to go there almost every week, and my, my buddy was a couple years older than me. He had a car so we could drive into Boston. And I guarantee you, he at least sold me at least one of those symbols. And I don't Crazy. remember him specifically, but I remember the counter. They kept all the symbols behind the counter, so I couldn't play with them. And I was afraid <laughs> to ask them to come behind yeah. the counter, you know? Yeah. But, yeah. so, okay. That's so, awesome. Yeah, that's 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 my thanks. Um, Actually, yeah. one more real quick. Corey Missouri. Um, has a fantastic uh, collection of dimensions and innovation symbols. And he really kind of opened my eyes to the dimension series and innovation series. I, I, I really just don't have the bandwidth to, to really study more current or modern uh, symbol lines. So, yeah. yeah. Last but well, not you, least, you Corey, saying that. You saying that is a good thing to say that for people who listen to this, you probably, it should be in the description somewhere, but we're, we're really looking more at the vintage side of things. So there will be a point where we hit a date where it's like, all right, we've gone to the same thing happened with the Zildjian episode. Yeah. We're about in the nineties. Things became laser engraved with a, with a, you know, serial number. It became a lot easier. My, my soft cutoff is 1986 and I'll, I'll explain okay. why and in, in the, in the future, why that's an important date. All right. Um, objective. Yes. Take it away. Why, why am I doing this? <laughs> um, so the, the, the objective of this, this podcast for me is to educate drummers um, on what symbols were made when, what they were made out of, which is very, very important. Um, in an objective manner, what symbols sound good and what symbols don't sound good. Um, I don't really like to speculate on actual dollar amounts. I don't think that's fair to say this is worth this this dollar amount. People ask me all the time. It's like I don't yeah. I don't I don't want to do that. Um, because it's it's it comes down to, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And some people may think a symbol is really valuable, where other people think it's you know it's junk. One of the things also is um, a drummer that's that's maybe relatively young or, or new or just looking to dip their toe and they wanna buy a Pisces symbol, but they don't know what to buy. And buying used is always a good bet because you could usually get stuff a lot cheaper. So then the question is, is what do you buy? And the number one concern I have is guys like that with no experience getting ripped off. Um, it's, yep. it's, and it's not, 
my experience, I've looked at hundreds and hundreds of ads, if not thousands of ads over the last several years. And people, they're not, they're not doing it on purpose, but literally yesterday I was on eBay and I found two ads. And one of them, a guy was selling a, a, a 502 series 20 inch crash or ride that had a 1992 serial number on it. But he said that it was a 1970 Stambul. And it's like, no, it's, and I just said, you know, I sent him a message. Another mm-hmm. gentleman um, who was very gracious was selling a 70 Stambul, and I'll get into it later. But he he had a German made Stambul, which had a German serial, and it had a one. The first digit was a one. So he said, hey, this is a 1971 Stambul. And I sent him a message saying, no, that's a German Stambul. The second digit is is generally indicated of the year, and it's a five. So that was made in 75. That's still a good okay. symbol, but it's yeah. not 1971. And Pisces didn't apply serial numbers until 72. So it's impossible for it to be a 71. So these yeah. are some of the little things that it, it's it's important to understand if, if you really are looking for, you know, a, a good value. And, and symbols are expensive, you know? Yeah. I mean, they're used symbols, especially some of them, like giant beats are over $1,000, you know? This week's episode is brought to you by GM Designs Custom Symbols. GM Designs is not your typical symbol company. They create symbols that you won't see anywhere else. Things such as B20 finger symbols, a B20 triangle, a multi-bell symbol, and very recently they created the largest bell ever on a symbol at 10 inches. In addition to creating their own original symbols, they also take old ideas that are no longer in production, revise them, and make them available again. Also, recently, Pat Mostoletto, formerly of King Crimson, was using a GMD uh, multi-bell symbol, which is super cool. Whether you're a studio musician, a touring professional, or a passionate beginner, GM Designs offers a diverse selection of symbols to cater to your musical needs. Visit their website to explore their gallery of products, store links, and latest features at gmdsymbols.com. That's gmdsymbols.com. Knowledge is power, and it makes it, and I said in the Zildjian episode, it makes it more fun to go symbol shopping to have this knowledge. So we yeah. appreciate you doing it and uh, and all that good stuff. So, yes. I, I also wanted to expose people to Pisces, the company, because there's very little known about them. They're very much a mystery, and that's the reason why I got into it, because I had owned and played Pisces symbols since 1978. And before the internet and all that, I mean, all you had was brochures and music stores, you know, or Modern Drummer articles. And I was obviously a Modern Drummer subscriber. And with Peisty, there's just nothing. There's just, there's nothing. I mean, there's no yeah. history. I mean, there's, there is information on their website, but in general, when you look at Zildjian and you look at all the history and all the interviews, all the magazine interviews and just all the exposure they get and even Sabian, and then you look at Peisty, it's like, you know, yeah, it's it, and there's it's there's such a unique company and they created a new sound. There was one standard, which is basically the Turkish symbol standard, which is what Zildjian and Sabian have. And Pisces created basically a new symbol standard. And this symbol standard in the 1970s literally dominated and it changed the sound of rock music. It's very important for you know drummers and artists in Pisces understand how important they were and they are to the sound of drumming you know they really really changed they really changed things and they became really a second uh uh, factor i mean you know symbols there's there's the turkish sound and there's the european sound basically what what it boils down to yeah totally and you don't have to like one or the other you can like both you can like you can mix them there's no rules it's sure. uh, it's all about what you like, but um, yeah. let's jump into on your timeline here. I believe the next thing would be the symbol production process. Get a little yes. information about that. Yeah, and and I I have I, I'm a certified machinist, which is not metallurgy, but I do have some experience with a little bit of metallurgy, and I've done a lot of reading and and like everybody just said, I've watched a lot of YouTube videos. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. you know, and I also had way back when I had the the symbol book by Hugo Pinksterboer. I think that's how you pronounce his name. Um, yeah. But in a nutshell, there's a few things that's in the um, in the in the popular vernacular with drummers. And the number one thing that really is inaccurate is the term cast versus versus sheet bronze. And 
I hate to say this, but, and I don't want to offend anybody, but my, my experience, I have copies of the advertisements. In 1980, 1981, Zildjian ran a series of ads in Modern Drummer. And they referred to it as a competition of having cookie cutter symbols cut out of sheet metal. Now, what they're referring to is the way B8 alloy is made. And to be totally accurate, all symbols are cast, period. Doesn't matter what they are, all symbols are cast. Casting is a process of either heating up a metal till it's molten or heating up an alloy, right? Or two metals mix it until they're molten, pouring it in a mold, right? That's casting and letting it cool. And when it cools, you have an ingot. Now the ingot could be the size, could be shaped by basically a cast iron frying pan, which is what you see with like the Bosphorus videos when they're making symbols, right? Or it could be a long bar, you know, which is probably what Pisces, what, what Pisces supplier uh, Myelin Works uh, 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 produces. Um, even the cheap brass symbols, the cheapest brass symbols, they're still cast because you have to be, you have to melt the metal and mix it and then pour it, let it cool, and then you roll it out. Now, the difference is between the Turkish way is, number one, they're only working with uh, a, a B20. So B20 is, is really fragile. It has to be constantly heated uh, in, in order to be worked and rolled. So they do it in small pieces, which is a small ingot, and they roll it out, and it's a sheet. If you look at Zildjian and Sabian production videos, it's a sheet. It's small, you know, it's you know the size of, of like a big symbol, but it's just a flat curved sheet. With Pisces, especially with B8, the difference is it's a very big long sheet. Hmm. So that's basically what it comes down to. All symbols are cast and all, all symbols are rolled. You know, the details really come down to the type of alloy. Like, it, and we'll get into that very quickly. The other thing that uh, I think is uh, really important in this beginning uh, process with, with Pisces Symbol Production Process is they are the only symbol company that hammers all of their symbols, top line symbols, to shape them or into shape. In other words, the bow or the curve of the symbol is created by hammering. Now. Some some other symbol lines, like I'm like I'm sure with Sabian's H8 series, they are hand hammered into shape. But the large portion of symbols you buy today, without exception, are stamped in the shape. And it's in the videos. It's in the Zildjian video and it's in the Sabian yeah. video. So Pisces basically developed a process in 1952 using a mechanized hammer. And they still use that same process. And that's important for people buying. Pisces symbols to understand. Why are they so expensive? Because out of the big four, right? Sabian, Zildjian, Pisces, and, and Meinl, yep. um, Pisces by far have the most handwork, the most labor involved in producing a symbol. Yeah. And I think that's a common misconception sometimes if people think hand hammered is only guy sitting there with an anvil hammering with his hand. It still qualifies as hand hammered using the mechanized hammer working yeah. it. Correct. Uh, what what, the, what I call it is manually machine hammered because they're yeah. using a machine, but they're manually controlling it. And that was a process that Robert Pisces developed in 1952. His father, Mikhail, bought a machine and said, hey, look at this. It'll sort of save us time. And the other symbol smiths didn't want to use it. And Robert figured out, okay, he figured out the technique. He's the one who invented the strap and the spindle that you strap to your knee. That's what they basically have been doing since 1952. So they gotcha. are the only symbol company that still produces their symbols. And this is top line symbols. You know, we're talking 2002s, 602s, right? Signatures. Um, masters are different because they're partially made in Turkey. So they are hand hammered by hand. Anyways, hmm. gotcha. To wrap this up, the other big uh, um, factor is. Pisces alloy, especially we're talking B20, their B20 alloy is different. Why do 602 sound so different than an A Zildjian or say an AA? Why do they sound so different? The majority of it is actually the alloy. It's how the alloy is made, how it's heated and rolled. And that is what actually is creating that clean sound, that clean kind of crystalline sound that 602s have, where 
sapiens and zildjians are much thicker. I, 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 I to me, the, the classic A zildjian is, sound is creamy. To me, it sounds creamy. It sounds I can like, see that. you know, to, to me, if it was ice cream, it'd be coffee ice cream. <laughs> Because it's cr- it's creamy and it has a thickness yeah. and it has that you know we're six oh two. What would pi- what kind of ice cream would Peisty be? Raspberry sorbet. <laughs> Duh. A, a six oh two, and then two thousand twos sure. would be rainbow sherbet. <laughs> okay, makes perfect sense. Yes, I understand completely. <laughs> so, I'll try to go through this quickly. We could we could go through the alloys really quick. Sure. Yeah. Um. We'll start with the most basic, which is brass. Um, uh, 63% copper, 37% zinc. Um, this is a very inexpensive material. Uh, Peisty does make a series right now out of brass, I believe the PST3. Um, but in general, that's not a desirable symbol. Um, it's not something that you would really consider collecting. Yeah. Um, the next one is a big one for Piesty, and that's nickel, silver, or NS12. And that's roughly 64% copper, 12% nickel, 24% zinc. And it's a, it was traditionally known as German silver. And I found out recently that Soviet coins were made from nickel silver. So I thought that was kind interesting. of interesting. So. Yeah, very quickly I'll say that I did an episode, a short little thing on YouTube about my great-great-grandpa's Prussian style snare drum from the 1880s. Yes, but they they said that they made them out of German silver. Yep. Some of them. So very interesting. That's That's NS12. Connecting it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that was very, very common alloy. They made silverware out of it too in Germany. Interesting. Now, the thing is, 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 you know, again, remember, Piesty basically started around 1900, 1905. And. My understanding is uh, Mikhail, who was the son of the original founder, Mikhail T, um, took over in 24. And he, uh, this is speculation, but I think this is when he say switched from brass to nickel silver. And he was producing nickel silver symbols all the way through the 30s, even through World War II, if he could get the material and continue up until 57. So this was their only alloy, really. Oh, I'm sorry, let me take that back. Br- they also use brass for their Zilco series, which was the lower line s- series, but Stambul's were nickel silver. That's And, and that's all they had because there was no B20, at, at least in Northern Europe. The Italians had it because they were the capital of producing bells. So they had bell bronze and hmm, makes uh, sense. Uh, UFIP, which was founded in 1930 was producing B20 symbols, but they didn't have it in Germany or, or Northern Europe. So this is what they had, and this is this is what they had to work with. Um, it's an okay sounding alloy. It could sound pretty decent, but to me, it tends to be kind of dry and almost kind of tinny sounding. Is it collectible? I mean, maybe that's just a question I'll throw in here and there. Are those collectible symbols or? They, they can be. They can be if you're looking for a particular sound. If you're kind of looking for that 50s, 60s, you know, okay. kind of, I, I don't even know what you would call it. I mean, I think even like kind of the Mersey beat sound in England because uh, Zins were made out of nickel silver and they were real popular in the early 60s, actually through, throughout the 60s. Um, gotcha. R- Ringo had one. Ringo had a nickel silver Stambul Big Bell in like 62, 63. So they were pretty common. I guess we can move on to the big one. <laughs> sure. Which is B20. So, and, and I cover, I think I cover a lot of the, the production uh, of it uh, in, in our, our previous podcast. Um, yeah. But it was Robert when he, he moved to Switzerland. He was looking for, he was looking to set up a factory, 56, 57. He was basically starting to take over the company from his father, from Mikhail. And he found a spot in Switzerland. They, Robert Tumas are actually looking to get into the United States or Canada, but they couldn't. That's, and that would have been pretty crazy. Pisces yeah. set, setting up in the United States in 1957. <laughs> wow. <laughs> anyway, Just think of what could have been. Yeah. yeah. At any rate, long story short, he found a little shop and set it up and it was right on the lake, which is, it, which is not well, Switzerland. Robert didn't know at the time, but across the lake was Swiss metal, 
and they were producing coins for the Swiss Mint. And Swiss coins are made out of B20 bronze. So that was his source for B20. Anyways, long story short, um, B, what is special about B20? Everybody knows, or most people know, it's 80% it's, um, copper, 20% tin. Um, at that ratio, those two metals don't like to stay together. And there's a lot of work involved. It's, it's what, what you would call, it's called a two-phase alloy, which means the tin is not completely dissolved in the copper. Um, that basically makes the material brittle and prone to cracking. What that means is there is a lot of heating um, required to get the, the material into a state that it's malleable enough that you could work it, that you could roll it and then make it soft enough where you can actually hammer it without cracking. Um, so it's a very hard material to work with. So last but not least, um, Pisces started using B20 and 57, and they used the same supplier all the way till 90, about 94, which was Swiss metal. And Swiss Metal ran into financial problems, and Peisty was not a big customer. And I believe Swiss Metal could not justify the expense of producing runs for them in such a small quantity. So mm. they basically stopped their relationship. And that's the reason why Sound Creations and 602s were discontinued, was the lack of material. So next on the list uh, is B8. So B8 is as most people know, 8% tin and 92% copper. There's a lot more copper involved. Uh, it's actually an industrial alloy, so it's actually readily available, and it's actually used for bearings, for plane bearings, on a lot of industrial equipment. Um, B8 is single phase, which means that the tin completely mixes with, with the copper, so you don't have the problems of it being brittle. So that means that it can be cold rolled. And what that means is that you don't have to heat it into a state where it, it softens up basically uh, to roll. When you cold roll it, it actually hardens alloy. It's called uh, um, strain hardening. Um, mm. And this, this is a process that actually is good because as a general rule, B8 is substantially softer than B20 is. Um, now, Robert started to experiment with B8 in 1963. So he he was looking for a replacement for nickel silver because he knew yeah. that nickel silver with B20 he was producing a world world class symbols that could compete with Zildjian on an even keel. I mean they were very good sounding symbols. These were actually the super formula 602s, which we'll get into later. Um and then very quickly after that were the formula 602s. Um with B8 his original intention was to replace nickel silver. So in a lot of ways, it was his intention originally was budgetary to produce, you know, a second line of symbols. So yeah. what he did produce was the Stambul 65 in 1965, of course. The funny thing is, is I don't really see them as being a, like a second line symbol because their sound quality is and their construction is on par with the 602s from the era. Now, the funny thing is, is that they were still producing Stambouls, regular Stambouls out of nickel silver at the same time. I don't know why. I don't know why they produced these lines in parallel, but they did. Um, yeah. Well, B8 as, always, forever, has kind of a connotation of a cheaper symbol, probably yeah. because there was the Sabian B8s and stuff like that. But uh, yes. Pisces has always been the exception of that rule, not rule, soft rule of, of B8 yes. being cheaper. That that started with the Zildjian Amir around 1981. Uh, because sure. that that was their, because Zildjian didn't make a cheap entry level line. They had seconds, you know, that sells Zildjian seconds, right? Or they had uh, mm -hmm. Zil, Zilcos, but those were seconds. They were just stamped, you know, it, it, with a different name, but there was a Zildjian. It, it was an A Zildjian. But what happened was that Robert quickly discovered, obviously, the sonic properties. They sound, B8 sounds a lot better than nickel silver. But he discovered that all that copper uh, definitely had very unique uh, uh, qualities. And very soon after that, in 1967, he came up with, this, with another series, the second B8 series, which most people think was the first B8 series, which is not. It's the Giant Beat. The Giant Beat was the second series that they produced out of B8. And mm -hmm. 
During that period of time, 65 to 67, when you look at music history, you see the big explosion, obviously, with the Beatles, the British invasion, but especially in Europe, they have what was called beat music, which is rock, you know, and that was amplified rock that had a really strong 4x4 beat, right? And, yep. it, and it was spearheaded by the Beatles. But that amplified music, even in 65, you know, bands were using bigger, more powerful amps. By 67, you know, you're talking cream with, with Eric Clapton and Marshall Stacks, right? So, yep. you know, Robert's like, okay, you know, we'll, we'll produce another line. This will be, you know, I, it's basically considered a, a, a top of the line series, you know, but that was the giant beat. So let's, we'll get to that, but let's, sure. let's move, let's move into the, to the last really two. And the next one is B15, which is n- known as the signature alloy. And that is, that is a troubled child. I found out. Um, it is a very unique mix. Um, uh, Mr. Fritz had a lot of background on this and I asked him, I said, why, I'm sorry, it was actually Freddie I asked about why B15, why not B14 or B16 or B11? Yeah. And Freddie said that B15 had the sonic properties that is what Robert wanted. Now, real quick with metallurgy, there's a turnover point. I've talked about single phase and two phase alloys, right? B12 is a turnover point. And it's interesting that both Zildjian and Minel make symbols out of B12. I think the Zildjian S series is B12. I, I'm pretty okay, sure. Okay, cool. Could be wrong. Yeah. B12 is as high as you can go uh, with tin, 12% tin, where it still completely mixes with copper. Once you get above 12, you get into 13% tin, it becomes a two phase alloy where it's not completely mixed. And that is when you run into problems and you have to start heating the alloy in order to work it. So with B15, it had a very troubled childhood in that the first thing is with the production is it initially is hot rolled like B20 is, but the last several rolling stages are cold rolled like B8 is. Um, the first problem they have is when they cold roll it like that, they get surface cracking. It's very small micro cracks on the surface. Now you may ask, well, why don't they just hot roll it? Well, when you hot roll it, you're changing the crystalline structure of the alloy itself when it's that hot. And Robert didn't want to do that. That was going to change the sonic properties. When you cold roll it, you're hardening the alloy, like with B8, the strain hardening, right? So that was what he was looking for, for whatever reason, right? That particular mix of initially hot rolling and then cold rolling it to thin it out and thin it out. That's what worked to give him the sound he wanted, which became the signature Mm. and the signature traditionals and on and on and on. The original mill he used was called Kovahudi, and they were in the Czech Republic. And he originally developed the the alloy with the chief metallurgist, uh, who was also an organist. He played the, the church organ. Hmm. And we'll we'll get into this later, but they had a lot of production problems with it. And they ended up moving production to Wyland Works very, very quickly after signatures were released. At any rate, the bottom line with B15 is they have to grind off 20% off the top and 20% off the bottom of the sheet to get rid of the surface cracking. So when Pisic produces a blank of B20, 40% of that is thrown away. Now it's recycled, but yeah. it's that's still, they're losing that amount of alloy. So when people say, why are, why are signatures so expensive? That's why. That's one yeah, of the main sure. reasons is because you're losing 40% of the material right off the top. Jeez. Okay. It's good. La- last one is the the Master Series 2020 Masters. Um, I told to get this in that Mino really changed the standard. Uh, I don't know when they came out with the Bi- Bison Series. I think it was probably 10 years ago or so. But they really changed the industry in that they mass produced, they built their own factory in Turkey. And they mass produce the symbols there. They don't, it's the, they own it, but they're using Turkish symbol smiths that are on their payroll. Heisty, and, and I see the logic, this makes a lot of sense. They wanted control, but they also wanted the Turkish sound. And that's when the material is heated and rolled in Turkey, the old Turkish way, it creates inconsistencies in the alloy. And that's what gives it that dark, complex, almost kind of 
the, I, I, to me, it's it's dissonant, that dissonant tone, which people love mm-hmm. with Kate Zildjian's, right? A lot yeah. of that is the alloy. It's also the heavy hammering, but a lot of that comes down to the alloy and actually the inconsistencies in the alloy, hardness and mix and, and so on and so on. So with the Master Series, Peisty, I think, really uh, uh, developed the, be- the best of both worlds and that they have the, the I, I don't know the exact details, but the material is cast, right, and rolled in Turkey and then finished in Switzerland. So they're mm. able to get that that antique Turkish sound. So, yeah, those, good to know. Those so are those are our, those are the alloys, which yeah. are which plays into the uh, collectability. Obviously, as you said, because of the process and and material being lost and the you know getting it from <laughs> Turkey to Switzerland. Yeah. So okay, that's very good to know. And I again, I now I know more than I did before, even having you on the show before. So um, next on your timeline, we've got the the factories. Now yes. let's hear a little bit about this, but also about how this plays into the collectability of each is one more collectible than the other yeah yeah it's it's and i'll go into i think some details uh when we actually get into individual models um because as okay as everybody knows history wise heist had the german factory they they actually uh uh founded it in 1947. they had about a two-year span where they're refugees uh in northern germany and obviously they had no money, they had nothing, so they couldn't produce any symbols. What I did read about in an article was actually in a, a Estonian drum magazine was that Mikhail set up the original production in an abandoned barn. They found a, a barn that had been abandoned and that's where they started production in 1947. Hmm. Yeah. Cool. So the other thing with Mikhail in the German factory is he had been producing gongs at least since the 1930s. And it's really, really overlooked with Pisces history and just their, the company in general is that they are the, the world standard for producing gongs. And they have been for a very long time. And as far as I know, they are the only symbol company that produces gongs. Um, really? I, could be, I could be wrong, but I know in the past, at least with Zildjian, that they sourced their, their gongs from Taiwan. So the German factory has always produced gongs. Uh, not well, the Swiss factory never has produced gongs. And the gongs are made from nickel silver. And I didn't know that either until recently. I'm like, oh, okay, that makes perfect sense. Now, I know Be- a, yeah. a few Because it's so much material, why not use the, the cheaper of the, I guess, alloys? Is that kind of the thought behind that? Or Well, because it goes back to the, at least the 1930s, because Mikhail was producing yeah. the same oh, gongs yeah. in the 1930s out of nickel silver. And, you know, they were used by orchestras throughout Europe and even in the U.S. Gotcha. So they continue that tradition. Now, I know recently, I, again, I, I really bad at keeping track on the latest, uh, probably the last 10 years or so, Pisces started producing B20 gongs. But I, I, I don't I don't know if they still produce nickel silver. I kind of assume that they do. Sure. But that's really the German factories claim the fame. And they've got some wonderful people there to this day that are still producing gongs. And these are really, these are, talk about hand hammering. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen some videos. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. Guys with 10, 15 pound sledgehammers. You know, Jeez, and that's five, awesome. five guys holding up the gong, you know. <laughs> so. Um, wow. Very cool. But in, in general, with the German factory, what's important to understand is they never officially produced B20 symbols. That was Robert's thing. And the German factory is very much the old world, pot, old world Peisty. That's the Mikhail Peisty, where not well, the Swiss factory is Robert. And that's the new world Peisty. Um, what the German factory did do is they always produced lower line symbols, and they still do, all the entry level symbols. And for a long period of time, through the 70s and through part of the 80s, they produced 2002s. So if you get on German eBay or German uh, auction site, you'll see a 2002s. I have a, I have a one. I'd actually like to, to, to buy more. Um, you'll yeah. see them made in Germany on the stamp. Now, supposedly, they're a little heavier and they sound a little different than the Swiss made 2002s, which I have never been able to do a side by side because I don't own any any German 2002s with the exception of, of one little 13 inch. So 
I, I haven't been able to make that comparison. But so just to clarify real quick, so people know, so you said German symbols were the lower tier kind of more mass produced symbols or the, the lower end symbols? Traditionally, be, well, because they, they never made 602, so they never made the top yeah. line symbols. Got there it. is an exception where there was a period of time where they were, when, when original 602 production started, they actually did finish them. Now, I don't know if that means just lathing or if it means hammering and lathing or what exactly that means, but yeah. there were some that were finished there because they needed the extra manpower. The other thing, and there's an irony, I, I, I should actually get to this later, but there are some German produced 602s in the 70s, which are very odd, which I'm still trying That's to understand. That's cool, though. Yeah, that's the why. stuff I love to hear, and I think yeah. people like to hear about those little oddity collectible things. But yeah. it's also worth noting as we go that, like, I think most people think of Peisty as a Swiss symbol company, but really yeah. we got to remember back to their Estonian beginnings, and then really as refugees traveling around, yeah. and then we do obviously end up with a Swiss factory, which we're talking about now. But uh, just interesting that they have a further, it I, goes I, further back than that. I think. I mean, this is a very simple, fun explanation, but I think the easiest way to explain it is in some ways the German factory is the way the old ASCO plant in Canada was to Zildjian in the 70s. Okay. That's yeah. kind of, that's probably the best way to describe it in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, now, they traditionally, yes, they, they produce 2002s and then all the lines below that. They also have a history too, which is very strange of producing symbols at the and I'll, I'll get into this uh, uh, in a little bit about about Pisces switching all, all their symbols. The, the great B8 shift of 7172, basically, is what it's <laughs> called. But yeah. the German factory has this weird history of still producing nickel silver soul symbols here and there throughout the 70s. It's very strange. Sure. Um, at any rate, um, to wrap it up, uh, Mikhail and his wife lived there uh, until he passed away in 63. Um, my understanding is that he literally had nothing to do, even though from 57 to 63, there was about a six, seven year span. He had nothing to do with the Swiss factory that was all Robert. Robert basically had taken over the company by then, and he actually started putting his name on some of the symbols, some of the very early, like 57 produced Stambouls. He would put mm. his name on them. That's Zildjian-ish to me, how there's K Zildjian and A Zildjian running simultaneously. It's less split than that, obviously, yeah. by, you know, geographically, but uh, interesting. Yeah, You kind of have this fork in the road and you kind of have the old road and then you have, you know, and that's and that's old yeah. world and new world, you know. Yeah. So Swiss factory, I mean, we kind of already pretty much covered it. Um, sure. it, it was uh, uh, obviously it was it was it was it was so it was just so happenstance the fact that robert founded this location or decided to set up his shop across the lake from uh swiss metal because if he had set up anywhere else in switzerland he may have never even known a swiss of swiss metal and he may have never produced b20 symbols which means that you wouldn't have the Pisces that you have today. I mean, yeah, B20 and the 602s, there's several things down the, to the, the years, but this to me is, this is the turning point for Pisces in so many ways. The fact that, that they were producing B20 symbols, the super form of the 602. And, and we think 57, 59, even a little bit later than that. At any rate, so that's sure. kind of, we kind of already know about the Swiss factory. Um, so that's kind of that deal. So yeah, okay. I guess we, we can move on to the next subject, which this is going to get a little, uh, <laughs> a little in depth. So I'm asking people to kind of hold on because the juicy stuff is coming, but I kind of <laughs> need to, I need to get through serial numbers first, if that's okay. Yeah. I mean, I've learned with the Zildjian episode of symbol collecting that serial numbers are deep and kind of confusing but again dan's providing a lot of photos and information that will be with the youtube portion of this uh that hopefully yes. but this is collecting this is the stuff so without just hop in let's do it so okay let me preface it by saying it's it's relatively widely known and it's very easy that swiss serial numbers the swiss factory um the first digit equals a year 
Um, and, and we'll go through the different uh, generations because they, they did change the format as far as the stamp, but the numbering format basically stayed the same with one exception with, with newer symbols where they had to go to eight digits. But you started out with six digits in 1972, first digit equals a year, period. Okay, now let's kind of back up and let's go over German serials because it's really important. And this is where it gets really confusing because if you're looking for vintage Pisces, especially if they're 2002s or Stambouls, and I'll go through the models individually, but with German produced 2002s and Stambouls or any other symbol line, starting around, I guess it was 73, I think I have one example, I think I have a picture of it, uh, but really I think it was more around 74, they started applying serial numbers. Um, their numbers are consecutive. In other words, it's like an odometer, but they started with one three zero zero. Zero zero zero. Um, mm. I don't even think that's eight. That gets nine digits. Anyways, you get the idea. Yeah, sure. What it what that means is during the seventies, the second digit of the serial actually is not a hundred percent accurate, but it's a very good general indicator of the year. So if you have a serial number that starts with one three, that means it's produced in seventy three. Um, the gentleman that I messaged uh, last night on on. Uh, eBay, he had a Stambul, a German-made Stambul, and it was 15, you know, XX, XX. And I said, hey, this is from 1975. So th it's very confusing. Now, the problem is, is that people see that one, they think 1971. It's like, oh, I got a 71, you know, Pisces. It's like, no, there's no such thing. I mean, between myself and Steve Black and Todd Little and a dozen other guys, we've looked at thousands and thousands of Pisces, and there's just, there's zero like less than zero evidence that Pisces applied serial numbers in 1971. It's 1972. So before that, there's just there's it's just a stamp. There's no serial number. Correct. Correct. Okay. So long story short, with Germans, you get up to about 1980, and that's when the serial when the odometer turns over to a two. So you basically get two, you know, zero 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 zero, um, and. Beyond that, it's probably best to reference the wiki instead of just boring you guys. But I think that's th smart, and that's what yeah. Vincent did in the in the Zildjian yeah. episode. Because again, it's there's references that have been created yeah. by you and by Steve yeah. Black and all these guys. So I think you're you're fine doing that. Now, back to Swiss serial numbers. Um, first thing is is that there's a, what we call a transition period around seventy seventy one, and I'll, I, I'm sure I have a picture of it that 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 we could show. Um, there was a short period with pre serial Pisces around 7071 where they put the ink stamp, the name Pisces above the bell, but there was no, there was no series name. In other words, it didn't say 2002 or Formula 602, right? It just said Pisces. And then at three o'clock, it had the, uh, the weight in red ink, right? You know, thin crash or medium or ride or heavy, right? Um, I actually have one in back of me. Very cool symbols. Um, 72, obviously, we got serial numbers, and it seems right around the same time, that's also when Pisces put the series name. So it would say Pisces from the 602 or Pisces 2002, right? The one thing I did forget to mention is in this era, the very early serial number era, is Pisces also added what we call the outline stamp on the bottom of the symbol, right? That's the name Pisces. Now, they didn't do this with giant beads. That's the one exception. Why? I don't know. But that is the best way, and this is what I I got to refer to George Flutus, my friend, my friend Georgie boy. Um, this is one of the main indicators how he's able to determine whether Bonham was playing two thousand twos or giant beats, because when he had two thousand twos, you could see that that stamp, like in the picture in in Song Remains the Same, right? Yeah. But he doesn't have that on his ride in the South, Song Remains the Same picture because he's still using a giant beat ride. So that's one of the the easiest ways to tell. Um, okay. okay, so going through this quickly, try to pick this up. Um, this is the black label era, six digits, right, for both Germany and, and Switzerland. Switzerland, first digit, so 72 is going to be a two, 73 is three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? 1980 is a zero. Uh, and then 1981, we get a one, right? And again, people confuse that with with the German 
symbols thinking because the German, you know, a 70s German symbol 2002 could have a one. Oh, it's 1981. No, that's, that's a Swiss made uh, 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 symbol. Also, um, very early in 81, and I also picture this, Peist, uh, the name Peisty was stamped above the serial. So this is another way, because you say, okay, well, if I have a 1982 symbol and a 1972 symbol, how do I tell them apart? Because they both start with a two, right? Well, the first thing is the 82 symbol is going to be a colored label, right? Because 81 in the spring, I think, is when they switched to colored labels for all the series, right? So red for 2002, blue for 602, green for 505, brown for 404, black for sound creation. And we didn't get here, but teal for the 101 series. But them stamping the name Peisty above the serial indicates that this is an 81 or an 82 symbol and not a 72 symbol. You also had, I think, I don't think they did it with the sound creation, but with 2002 and, and, and the 602 series, they actually put the model, the, ser- the series name as well. So I'll say Peisty 602 or Peisty 2002. Um, then for yeah. some reason, um, in 86, they dropped the, the series name and they just have the name Peisty. So from about 86 to about 1990, you have just Peisty and then a serial number. Now, it doesn't really matter because, you know, an 86 symbol is going to be a 6, an 87 is going to be a 7, on and on and on sure. and on and on. And you know yeah. it's not a 77 because a 77 would not have the name Peisty above it. Um, yeah. Well, can I ask you a question along, uh, real quick along those lines about if you had, uh, let's say, a, you know, a few 70s Peisties, a few 80s Peisties, and nothing, and they're all the same size, nothing had a label on it, there wasn't even stamps, could you guess 70s versus 80s just from yes. different te- production okay so so you can also use your kind of you know your your senses and and just looking at it with lathing and hammering and different things to tell the age a little bit correct well then i there there were ch- I, it, let's take 2002s for example all right to so the 70s into the 80s um this is a question that i th- i think i kind of asked Freddie because we were talking about this is one of the I was going to get into with the 2002 series about a lot of rumors think that the black labels sound different. They're mellower. No, it's it's metal fatigue. It's age. It's wear and tear. It's mileage. You okay. know? And yeah, yeah, yeah. Freddie said there were there were differences in construction, but a lot of that was to streamline production. It was actually economy. There were things that they could change. So it was quicker, easier to produce a symbol. I yeah. think I think also some of the changes were also for durability, especially for 2002s, which were rock symbol. So they were beat sure. on pretty hard. But generally, if you've got a range of 2002s from the 70s into the 80s, it's a serial number that's that's going to tell you and in the weight. Okay. So if you have all yeah. 18s and they're different weights, you know, you you can actually look it up on the wiki and you'll see. You know, this range of weights is a crash. This range of weights is a medium. This range of weights is a is a ride, you know. Got and it. then good to this, know. Okay, yeah. With the serial numbers, you'll be able to tell, you know, black labels to the seventies, and then you got the curved labels of the eighty six, then eighty six sure. to eighty nine. You have the the third format, and then once we get to about ninety ninety five, you have the third format, which it still just says Pisces, but they use the high low, right, with the Pisces logo, how the the, the letters are are offset. So they mm-hmm. do that with the Peisty name. So they run that format till about 1995. And 1995, I believe, is when we start seeing eight-digit serial numbers. And that ran until 2011. Now, the big difference is the first two digits are the year. So what you'll see is an a, a, a eight-digit serial will say 95. That's 1995, not 1999. It's 1995. Got it. Yeah. And then, and then 2011, they started laser etching the serials again, eight digits, but the, you know the same 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 format. Yeah, and I think if you're holding a symbol and you're trying to right now go, what did Dan just say? Hold on, I'm trying to look at my number. Yeah. The best thing to do though is to go to the symbol dot wiki and yeah. look at the Peisty page and just kind of take your time and match it up because again, there's you're all, just giving us a good yeah. overview of of this. So there's, yeah. a, there, there's a whole there's a whole chapter. There's a whole chapter on there's actually there's actually two separate chapters. One of them is um, 
PiST serial numbers, which basically focuses almost completely on serial numbers. And the other one is identifying your PiSTs. And that's more general about the type of alloy and also the type of stamp you have. With that said, I guess we can kind of get into the meat, meat and potatoes, which would be the different uh, symbol lines. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do okay. it. Okay. Sounds good. So the first one, which is kind of the granddaddy of everything, is the stamp bowl. Now, um, if if we start, probably the easiest way to start is if we start at the end and go backwards in some ways, or start at least start at the end and go back to the beginning, kind of like a a, 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 a good movie plot. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, yes, yeah, very cinematic. I, I don't have a real start date. I, I've read, seen... 1930, but we, as in the Pisces Wiki, don't have any information before 1950. 1950 is the earliest catalog we have. That's the earliest that we've seen anything related to Pisces. Um, we do know from interviews about uh, 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 pre-war in like 1947, about them setting up in a barn. Um, but supposedly Istanbul's go back to around 1930, which may make it, I didn't, I didn't do the math for this, but it's either the longest or one of the longest running symbol lines that Pisces made, because you're mm. talking 1930 to 1978. So that's a 48 year run. I think that 2002's beat that now, but it was a very long run that Istanbul became the 505, which we'll get into. And it was originally Pisces top tier symbol, nickel silver, of course, made, made in Germany. Right. Uh, yeah. Does Istanbul refer to the, you know, symbols, Turkish, Istanbul? Is that kind of pulling on that so, reference? So through, throughout history with, with Pisces stamps, um, the, the first thing is, is the, the acknowledgement and the reference to the Turkish style symbol. Right. I mean, when okay. you look at history, you basically have you've got. You have two. You have two styles of symbols. You have Chinese symbols, which are very old. I, I think they go back over a thousand years, or, or much more than that. Sure. And then you yeah. have you have Turkish style symbols, which is really the Western. That's what the Western world knows, and that's the standard, and that will, will always be the standard. And that is basically the shape, the sound, and the fact that they use B twenty, or, yep. or a close proximity of that of that mixture. So my understanding of Istanbul. There's a, there's a, my research, um, I was looking at old Sonar catalogs because Sonar had a relationship with Paiste, uh all throughout the 50s. They distributed Pisces. And I was looking at pre-war and I had a pre-war uh, Sonar catalog and they had K. Zildjian Stambul, K. Zildjian comma Stambul. And I'm like, oh my God, these are Pisces. And after doing further research, I realized, I believe, and somebody could correct me, that Stambul is basically the name of an area, a district, um, in Turkey, where those symbols were made, and that's that's where okay. Mikhail got that name from. But basically, Istanbul is a reference or acknowledgement of Turkish style symbols, which is what got he. Because remember, he also made gongs, which were Asian based. So sure. he had these two worlds, and he actually had traveled Asia and, and learned gong making in Asia, in the 1920s. So throughout history. You see the star and crescent moon, which is very heavily yep. associated with Turkey, and it's on the Turkish flag, which is actually Venus and the moon. And then with the majority of Pisces logos for their series, especially the top line one, you'll see the star and a crescent moon, and then you'll see rays emanating from that, which is, I think we talked about in, in the older episodes, that the name Pisces is to shine in Estonian. That's so I'm assuming right. That's right. I'm kind of making a guess here, an educated guess that that's how they developed that that uh, that that uh, logo for the 602. Now the Istanbul, cool. as as I have several examples, um, is quite different. And if you look very closely at the bottom where it has the cursive writing of Pisces, if you look at the P, it looks kind of messy. There's this weird kind of squiggle at the bottom, the base of the P. And if you look very closely, that's an M. And what it is is that's Mikhail Peistein, because oh, wow. that was that like was, a signature. Yes. Yeah. So the old so that was the old school Stambuls had this little hidden M in the base of the P for Mikhail Peisty. and that was that cool. was the last line that actually had his signature on. 
So um, with these, um, they're interesting. I mean, if anything, they're kind of um, uh, um, uh, a piece of history. I, I have one, actually, probably one of the very first symbols Mr. Fritz gave me. He... Uh, he 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 you know, he's owned a drum shop in in uh, south uh, southwestern Germany for several years, and a local school contacted him. And they said, "Hey, can you take our old stuff?" And there was an old closet. And he pulled a bunch of stuff out, and there was an old nickel silver stamp bowl. And he gave it to me, and I did all this research on it. And I looked at the stamp, and I looked at the symbol. I'm like, "This is hand hammered. Hmm. This is like this is really weird looking. This is a weird looking symbol." And I think it was the early period before fifty two. I think that's a. I think that's probably not forty seven, but probably forty nine or fifty is when they when Peiste moved to the Rendsburg plant, which is where they still are today in Germany. And I think this is a this is a pre machine hammered Stambul. What I have, so really quick with the Stambuls, um, and and what's important with them is because this ties in with the 602s. And if you're looking at it really actually with super formula 602s, which is which will be next on my list, with the old Stambuls, you have a couple of factors. One I call the big bell. And when you look at these symbols, the bells are kind of odd. They're like an igloo. They're very symmetrical and they're very kind of bulbous and round. And they're big for the size of the symbol. They also had small mounting holes because the symbol stands Right, the tilter was much smaller and much more flimsy. So instead of the standard half inch hole, you know, or 12 or 13 millimeter, because these were metric. Mm -hmm. The other thing, too, is that the, these Stambuls were all metric, they weren't in inches. So when you look at them and people put them up for sale, you know, they're like, you know, 18 and like a quarter inches because they're actually metric. And anyway, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. With the Stambuls, what you have through time is you have big bell, small hole and what I call the wide stamp. And the stamp is distinctly different. Then you get into what's called the narrow stamp, stamp bowls, and that's just the way that the stamp is, the, the format where it's closer together. I think this is around the time when Robert started producing stamp bowls in, in Switzerland in, in 57. Um, mm. The bell size, I think, continued up through uh, probably 63 or 64, uh, when they went to what's called the small, what I call the small bell. Um, now, during this time, and there's literally could do a whole other episode on this, is Pice's relationship with Ludwig. And you remember I was saying that yes. Robert, with discovering a B-20 source and producing B-20 symbols, completely changed the company and wouldn't be the company that they were today. Well, at the exact same time, there was Bill Ludwig Sr. and Bill Ludwig Jr., and if it wasn't for those guys and for Ludwig, again, Peisty would not be the company they are today. And yep. really quick, uh, I re really, uh, I, I'll get into this in distributors, but, but uh, Peisty uh, developed a distribution deal with Ludwig in 57. Well, in 56, because they were in the 57 catalog for Ludwig. Ludwig started selling uh, Stambouls uh, in the U.S. underneath Zildjian's as an entry-level symbol. Now, you know, Peisty has a history of this, and this is actually really important when you're looking at these old symbols. They have a history of creating a custom stamp for a particular distributor. They don't do that now, but they used to back in the 50s and 60s. So what they did is they created what's called the Ludwig Three Star. And it's a Ludwig name, a cursive writing. I, I've got a picture of this, and it's got three stars above it. And they were stamp bolts. There was literally all it was they changed the stamp. So they're nickel silver stamp bolts. Um, as we go through through time, you get up to about 64, 65. Um, and, and this really, really, I should cover more with Ludwig, but they changed the stamp and now they then become the Ludwig standard. Same symbol, still a stamp bowl. All they did was change the stamp, but it actually looks like a 602 stamp. Now, this is where it gets important. People sometimes configure the Ludwig standard stamp because it has... The crescent, the crescent moon star and the rays, and then it's a standard above it. But that format looks, it is, it's the same format they use for 602s. So a lot of people you know, that don't have experience with Pisces think, oh man, hey, this is an old 602. But it isn't. Uh, it's a nickel silver stamp bowl. 
Um, mm. Also during this time is when the bells changed. R- right before they went from the three star to the standard, which would have been around 64, 65, the bell size changed and it became more normal what we see today. So that's how I'm able to date the symbols. As you could see the change, um, there's very few small bell three star Ludwigs, but there are no big bell standard Ludwigs. And I know the Ludwig standard gotcha. came out about 65. So that means that they changed the bell size before that while they're still producing the three stars. But because there's not, a, I haven't seen a lot of the small bell three stars, it was probably the last year of production. So anyways, there's yeah. actually a lot of Ludwig standards and three stars on reverb, relatively speaking, a lot. And I don't think they're particularly valuable. Um, they're okay sounding cymbals. They're, they're very, I guess, niche oriented, you know, if you want a particular sound. But in, in, because nickel silver is really soft, they tend to get really tweaked. They're bent. The edges are bent. You know? Yeah, with modern playing and stuff. So Well, and, and they were beginner yeah. symbols. They were, they were sold. A lot of times they were given away. I actually have ads um, where it was part of a package deal. You buy a little drum set, you get a set of symbols. Sure. And I guarantee you those are three stars. Or those, were, those are standards. What did happen with symbols is around 71, 72, there's what I call the great BH shift. And that's when, for the most part, at least at the Swiss factory, um, they stopped so they stopped using nickel silver. And all the lower lines were switched over to B8. So that also, which happened with Istanbul, which is the Ludwig standard. Now, I actually have one. I have a B8 Ludwig standard. I've only seen a couple. They're really rare, where you see a ton of nickel silver standards. So my guess is from just the rarity that, and I'll, I'll get into more detail, that they stopped producing Ludwig standards around 72, maybe early 73, because mm. that's right when, when they came on, on stream, you know, full, full, full time with B8. Okay. Stambouls. Um, yep. Let me really. So quick- just to sum it up, though, collectability not super collectible. There's obviously some oddballs here and there yeah. that stick out as being a little more collectible, but beginner the, symbol. The the B B eight Stambouls. If you could find one later in the later seventies, I actually have a pair of hi hats, German made low thirteens. They're actually sound really good. I mean, they're really. Yeah. I mean, they're basically what they are. Is they're basically five hundred fives. Because they're the predecessor yeah. of the 505. But when they transitioned in 78, 77, 78 from Stambul to 505s, early 505s were made exactly the same. Same lathing, same gotcha. pattern, even had the same same weights that the Stambul series had. Now, for whatever reason, the early the early Stambul, and I'll get into Dixies also, the early Stambul and B8 Dixies are just they're kind of odd. The first thing is, is that Paiste has a habit of of their lower line series, especially back then, we're talking 60s, 70s, and even the 80s, but especially 60s and 70s, the lower line series like the Stambouls or the Dixie or the Ludwig Standard or also the the, logo, the Ludwig Stenopel, which is just a Dixie with a different mm-hmm. name, which I'm assuming is, is a contraction of Constantinople, right? Yes. The whole line are basically shifted down one weight. In other words, they're very thin. So... If you've got a symbol that's labeled a heavy, it's really more of a medium weight. It's the equivalent of like a 2002 medium, okay, in weight, okay. right? Which is really a crash or a crash ride. If you've got a symbol sure. labeled a medium, that's a thin. That's really a thin weight symbol. If you have a thin symbol that's labeled a thin, I've got a B8, uh, 18 inch Ludwig standard B8 thin. That thing is like paper mache. It is so thin, it's stupid. It's, ins- yeah. it's a paper thin symbol. So I, I think this was done basically for, for cost saving because you're using less material. I mean, that's my guess. But sure, okay. They just they don't they don't survive. And the nickel silver versions are basically the same way. They're very thin. You know, I mean, you have to really look into like a heavy to to really have a substantial weight symbol that you can crash or yeah. even write on. So to play, okay. Yeah. All now, right. real quick, that kind of appendix of the whole Stambul thing is the Stambul sixty five and. They're Paiste's best kept secret. The first thing is, symbols um, were never imported to the U.S. Now they were under Ludwig's name, right? 
But once the relationship, which I'll get into later, between Ludwig and Pisces, once 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 that ended, we never got Stambouls. We also never got Stambul 65s. That was a European only um, uh, series. So, like I was saying earlier, the 65 was the first B8 symbol. I was it was introduced in 65. We actually have a catalog from 65 that shows them listed. Um, and they only came in a two weights, thin crash and medium ride, and then a series of hi hats. 16, 18, 20, 22, and then 13, 14, 15 inch hi hats. Hi hats are pretty thin. They would be considered mm. like a medium hi hat at best. But they sound really good. I, I I love them. I've got I own about a dozen. And I even found wow. a pair, this crazy story. Um <laughs> Another story. This is another Mr. Fritz story. I call it the great clean out of 2003. There's a period around 2003, 2004 when Eric took over where he went through Pisces vault and he basically just anything that wasn't bolted down, he like kicked out the door because there was all of this stuff in there that was like it had been sitting around. And I believe there were some Stambul 65s that had been there for literally like 45 years. And I found a music store in Italy, like a big music chain, like a guitar center. They had these two 16 inch Stambul 65 thing crashes for sale. They were new, but these are oh pre serial. These are pre serial. Unbelievable. Stambul 65s got serial numbers. The Swiss versions got serial numbers in 72. Now, these are Germans, but these got to be like late 60s. Jeez. And they're, they're new old stock. So, and, and, I mean, they sound beautiful. They're amazing. I've got about three 18-inch crashes, uh, a couple 20s, a couple 22s. And I would say the closest they sound would be 505s because they're they're more gentle than 2002s. They're not as aggressive. But they still have that nice, sweet, high end that a, B8, yeah. that a good B8 symbol has. And they're, construction-wise, I mean... I don't know why they're considered, you know, a second tier symbol because because to me they look like you know top class symbols. At any rate, yeah. that was for me that was a big discovery. That was the I think that's Pisces' best kept secret, and they're actually relatively common in Germany. If you get on German eBay or or I'm going to mispronounce this Kleinenzegen, which is an offshoot of eBay. It's um, I forgot how it translates to, but it's very specific. They actually almost everything I bought was off of that one site because they oh, wow. just have, I don't know what it is with Germany, but it's, it's, you have talking to my friend Nils, a lot of it is you have, you have a, say a father or, or, or a grandfather that was a drummer and you know, he's old, he's retired, he hasn't played the drums for 20 years, or he sadly passed away. Now, one of the kids, is is going through their garage and they're cleaning out and they find his old drums and they put it up on German eBay. And, you know, you have these symbols that were last used in the 1970s and they've been sitting in a garage for 40, 45 years. And they put them up for sale, $100, $150, $200, yeah. you know. And yeah. they're amazing finds. And even with 602s, I don't get it. It's like with... The German market, it's like they keep their symbols in really good shape and they're like like cheap. They're like ridiculously, hmm. they're like ridiculously like undervalued. And yeah, I tell them, there's a good I, tip. Said, I don't understand. It's like if, if somebody sold a six, the, the, this 602 they're selling, we go for like triple the price here on Reverb. And he's like, well, he's yeah. like, that's the market. You know, a lot of it is it's because it's. The, the the children or the grandchildren are selling this and they don't know the value and they just, you know. So yep. there's, there's, there's some, an abundance of it. And, yeah, yeah. There's, there's some amazing finds. So, okay. So yep. let's let's get moving here. So let's let's go to the big one. This is this is the real big one. This is really the last year and a half or so. I really started out like my interest in collecting. I was like, oh, you know, I want to find like cool B8 symbols. I would like to be at sound and play 2002 since like 1980. Yada yada yada. I also played had some sound creations in 602s, which I really liked. But I'm like, you know, I, I I don't have a lot of money to spend, so I'll find some old cool Pisces that are B8. I learned all the with the weights, the really thin weights, the symbols are really kind of dead. They're really thin. They don't have a lot of sustain. And then I realized 
you know, especially with Mills' help, I could find really nice 602s, like old 602s, for really reasonable amounts. I also have a friend, Raphael Zimmerman in Switzerland, who lives across the lake from Notwell. Who, yes, great guy. Yep, who turns me on to, to symbols in Switzerland as well. And Italy is a big market too. Even though in my experience, they seem to be quite a bit more expensive than the symbols you find in Germany. Anyways, so when we get to 602s, we have to start with the super formula because that was the first one. There's a lot of speculation between Todd and I about exactly, you know, Paiste officially states they're produced from 57 to 59. But there's no, there's, we don't have any catalogs. In other words, we have a catalog from 58 that doesn't list them at all. Now, it's a German catalog, so it's hard to tell because that could be from the German factory. And all they have are Stambouls and Zilkos listed in 58. There's no mention of 602s. So it's really hard to tell. But kind of the general consensus is, is that Robert spent a couple years making these symbols in small quantities. They're kind of really almost prototypes. It wasn't until maybe 59 that he kind of settled on a consistent design, I guess. Again, this is speculation. Sure. What you yep. do have... And this is actually, and I've got, I'll, I'll show pictures. And I actually, I own about five super formulas right now. Hmm. Um, they're, they're not common, but they do come up again in Germany. Um, they had four stamps. They had two distinct styles. And, and each of those two styles, they had a variation. So, so four different stamps. Now, this is where it gets confusing. You had the Stambul style which again, I'll show a picture, and you've seen from the Stambul symbols, that very classic Paiste star and crescent moon and then trademark on each side and the name underneath. They use the same stamp, but then they put Super Formula 602 underneath it. Or it just said Super without 602. So that's the, that's the Super Formula, what we call the Super Formula Stambul stamp. Then we have what's called the Super Formula Plain Stamp, and that is the first sighting you see of the star and crescent moon and then the rays emanating from right to left, which is a classic mm. 602 logo, right? Well, yep. the first one, all it said was Paiste, and then star and crescent moon, and then the rays. There was no mention of Formula 602 or Super Formula 602. So I call those the plain stamp. And then there's a variation of that where it's the exact same stamp, but in the right corner in cursive writing, it says super. And I've never seen one of those. I have a picture of it, which I'll show. I've never seen one. Now, my friend Nils did recently buy a Stambul super only super formula 602. In other words, it doesn't say super formula 602. It's just a super under the standard Stambul stamp. Now, it's very confusing in that through this era, we're talking 59, 60, maybe 58, 59, 60, 61. Um, there was a changeover, in, and I'll, I'll show pictures of the shape of the bells. And what you see is, I'm assuming the early, early super formulas had the Stambul bell because they had the igloo-shaped bells, very symmetrical, very bulbous, right? And I have a couple of those. But I also have a super formula that has a much more conventional bell that's smaller and smoother. I would assume that the early, early big bell or Stambul shaped bells were the early versions. And then Robert switched to a different die to stamp the bell that was smaller and, and kind of more modern looking. Now, what doesn't make sense though is that the super formulas I have that have the, the, the old fashioned archaic bell. Those are the plain stamp. So those have the 602 format stamp. The symbols I have that have the more modern shape bell have the Stambul style stamp, which you think would be older. So it doesn't make any sense. So I don't understand yeah. why it, it should be backwards. The Stambul stamp should be older and then the plain stamp should come later. At any rate, um, Laden is, is different. Uh, the bells obviously are different on the early versions. Um, they're 602s, you know. They're B20, 
They're really, really good sounding cymbals. Now, unfortunately, all the ones I have are 14 and 15 inches. They're hi-hats. I don't have any crashes or rides, unfortunately. Hmm. Even though I do have one I bought from Italy that's at Nils' house, and Nils is going to ship me. I do have a 20-inch, probably a medium ride, that is a plain stamp. So it's just the plain the plain uh, 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 Crescent Moon Star and the Rays and a Peisty above it. So we'll yeah. see when I get it. I'll play with it. And it has the big bell also. So Yeah. Collectible, obviously, symbols because yes. that's, I mean, 602s are a flagship kind yeah. of, everyone knows them. Yeah. Here, yeah. Here, sure those are sought after. Here's something to take into account, too, is that all 602s, especially back then in the 60s, they were jazz symbols and they're played by jazz drummers, which means that they were pretty much ridden and not crashed. And if they were crashed, yes. they were crashed lightly and they were played with light sticks and they were not played hard, you yeah. know? My experience, B20 is more durable than B8 is. It's it's a harder okay. alloy, you know, and we'll get into it later with, with my experience with the clean and all that kind of stuff. It's, yep. it's it, there's a big difference because cleaning these symbols, they respond completely different to even a mild abrasive. A B20, just, I mean, you have to really just rub the crap out of it. Or B8, you can literally just let you wipe it and you see the thing polish up right away. And that has to do with hardness. Anyways. Yeah. Get into six hundred twos. Officially, fifty nine and ninety four is the official date, but but we're, we're thinking, you know, <laughs> you know, I me. Mean, it's really it's Todd, Todd is using advertising dates, and and this is what we have to go on. And again, this goes back to we just don't have any. There's no information from, from Peisty, even though I'm pretty sure they they may have documentation catalogs. I'm kind of assuming yeah. they are. They do. Yeah. I mean, they had Bonham's contract still you know from 71 yeah, but what's so. on the internet in a catalog here in america is not exactly what's yeah. actually the date so yeah, yeah. i, I get you anyways yeah. so we're thinking the official from the 602s uh we're thinking probably 62 maybe even as late as 63 now the first generation mm -hmm. 602s are very different and i have actually a few the first thing is a stamp and with, along with the plain stamp, you'll notice it's what I call the E over trade because the E of Peisty is over the little trade or of trademark. And you'll see that shift. There's a shifter on 65 where that the, the, the stamp is actually expanded as larger and they move the E over. So it is now, I guess it would be to the left of trademark. That's a big indicator. Now we have a couple of catalogs. We have a catalog that has the e, e over trade logo. We have another catalog from 65 that has the pre serial what we call the solid stamp. So we think around 64 is a turnover point where they changed that stamp. Now, there's another big factor too. Um, Ludwig, again, in the game, changing things. Um, they picked up in 64. They started to distribute in 65, 602s. And again, it really, I don't have enough information. I, I, I need to, to get off my butt and, and go like talk to a bunch of people, you know. But they took a trip to the factory. Uh, this was this was uh, Bill Jr. and Bob Yeager, who was the owner of the pro drum shop in Hollywood. His stepson still run it to this day. Uh, he was, Bob Yeager was one of Bill Ludwig's uh, largest um uh, distributors or, or customers, I guess, of Ludwig Drums. And he became kind of his um, technical advisor. So they paid a visit to Pisces at 64, and this is the beginning of the contract where Ludwig is going to distribute 602s in the United States, which I'll get into later. But we think that there was a turnover and not only the stamp, but also the design of the symbols, because I have, and I have a picture of it, a 70s 602 and then an e over trade 602 for about 63 and i have them side by side and the bell is completely different the lathing is different you know and it's still a 602 but design wise it's substantially different and it's a small hole it's a small mounting hole so hmm. they were still producing small mounting hole symbols probably in 63 or even 64. Um, wow and remind me real quick the small mounting hole is 
representative of what exactly it's, is that the more of the european it's the symbol stands of that era because they're very small and okay. flim- flimsy and the actual it. tilter itself that the the thread size they were using was was much smaller S- Okay, so yeah. it's not a geographic thing. It is a just to, to help date it. Yes, because I think Zildjian's from that era also had smaller holes too. Because there was Got actually a, a thread on DFO about should I drill out the hole on my classic Zildjian to fit on a modern stand? Sure. So yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So the other thing, um, the super formulas had different names too. Um, thin ride, thin ride crash, like think something like a medium ride crash. I assume that those all were dropped. When, when they transitioned to the 602. But I found out that they didn't. Um, even though it's not listed in the catalogs, um, and I, I'll, I'll cover this a little bit later, I've got an Arbiter Custom 602, which was the 602s that Ivor Arbiter distributed in England, which what Ringo had in yep. Get Back. Uh, at any rate, I found out it's very, very hard to see, but that, even though this is probably like a 63, 64 symbol, I was able to find the label. It's really, really faint, but you could see it in the picture. It's a thin ride, which mm. is it's the weight. It's really more like a thin crash. But some of the details, uh, which which actually are really important with dating 602s, um, going back to the stamps, um, this is around 64, 65 is when you have the changeover to what we call the solid stamp. This stamp was carried all the way up into the serial era. And I don't really know when they switched to what's what we call the outline stamp. Um, I've got a, a, I've got a 602 with a 74 serial number on it that has the solid stamp. So, but there's a story behind yeah. that too, which it may not be a, a 74 602. It could be a 70, 71, but they definitely carry yeah. o- over. You know, we're basically talking now. We, we have that. We have that landmark. Of, we know about sixty-five. They changed the stamp. So from about 62, 63 to sixty-five, you had the E over trade. Then at sixty-five, the big change. Ludwig came on board. It seems like they really changed the construction of the symbol. Um, standardized, much much more modern of what you see today. Okay, in a six hundred two today, or from the black labels in the seventies, right? As far as shape mm-hmm. of the bell, lathing, the model names, and then the stamp. And from that period of 65 to 71, right, right before they added serial numbers, this is when you see them expanding the line. Obviously, the big one was the addition of the sound edges, and this was around 67. And you could date sound edges and pre-serial sound edges in two different ways, generally. The first one is the number of ripples or waves on the bottom symbol. And it turns out that early sound edges had a lot more ripples, as many as, with a 14 inch, as many as 56. And then once we get into the, the serial number era, it drops down to, to as low as, I think about 32, which is what they, they, they use now. Um, mm. The other thing was, is that the early, the 67 through, I believe July 69, to be exact, um, you know, Pisces applied for a patent but they didn't get the patent until July 69. So, and I have a pair where that two year, two and a half year period, it just says patent pending on the inside of the symbol, inside the bell. So, you know, even though you don't have serial numbers, you know, okay, I've got pre serial 602s, sound edges, and it's, it only says patent pen. So, that means it's got to be produced between 67 and probably midpoint 69. So, mm. that's a good Yeah, that's indicator. helpful. Um, yeah. You also had around the same period of time was the introduction of the seven sound set. Now, I don't really have any proof of this except for just advertising, but Pierre Fave, Faver, I really don't know how to pronounce his last name, I'm sorry. He was Freddie Studer's predecessor, and he was basically the head of sound development or the main sound development person that worked with Robert, because Robert was really sound development. But he always had a a cohort, I guess the best way to put it. So Pierre worked for Pisces from 64 to 70. So I think this may have been part of his development because, um, I mean, it's just an advertisement, but it's him playing the seven sound set. Now, what is a seven sound set? It's seven unique symbols. But what it really is, it's Pisces' first introduction of a splash Chinese symbol flat ride, bell, 
Those are the ones that we still carry with us today. But those originally were not part of the regular 602 line. They were a separate, even though they were, they were formerly 602s, they were considered a separate line called the seven sound set. The Would thing, they be sold as one, like usually like as a, you, you could you could. buy them as a pack or, okay, cool. You could, or you could buy them individually. And Ludwig also offered them in their catalogs. Okay. Cool. So the other thing that's also of notoriety starting not only with the seven sound set, but also with the sound edges was the change in lathing. And people know when they look at 602s, they have very um, unique coarse lathing. When you look at the lathing, it's actually really big. The, the lands and grooves, right, on a, on a 602 uh, is, is, is very present. I don't know how else to put it. It's big, <laughs> thick. Sure. <laughs> and with the sound edges, it almost looks like they're not lathed because it's so fine. And all the symbols in the seven sound set same way they have that ultra fine lathing the bell the splash the flat ride the chinese symbol now what i found out recently wasn't until i bought one it's over there um i've only had uh 2002 505 in south creation chinas um the 602 china mm -hmm. which is really it wasn't the first chinese symbol they produced they actually produced a march in china uh in the Istanbul series before that but top line chinese symbol was yeah the 602 China type. Now, the weird thing was, is when I got mine, I thought there was something wrong with it because it's not a Chinese symbol. It's a pang. Really? Which is a little flatter and not the as edge like... Is, the edge is not curved. It's the bow, the yeah. symbol comes down and then the edge is completely yeah. flat. I, I didn't realize that. And I actually asked Daniel Plasco because he's got, he's got all three or he's got four. He's got 16, 18, 20, and 22. Blue mm. label 602s. I'm like, hey, I said... Is the edge curved? He's like, no, they're flat. I'm like, what? I didn't realize that. Because they're, <laughs> they're unique. Yeah, and they're they're much more. They don't they don't have that traditional Chinese sound. They they sound a lot like a Zildjian Pang, which has a lot more sustain. It is Chinese ish sounding, but it's definitely more more of a crash symbol sound. At any rate, mm. um, the last one uh, that has the same type of lathing was. The first artist model series. Sabian is not the first symbol company to offer model series. And I know that they've advertised that for years. I don't know why, because it's it's widely known that Peisty made the Joe Morello set with the deal with Ludwig. I don't know the exact details because I, I've got Bill Ludwig's book. He doesn't really talk about how, but they got Joe to endorse Peisty and he played Peisty for quite a long time. Uh, and I believe this was probably around 66, 67. And I'll have to check the wiki, but I think the Joe Morello set came out around 67. They were 602s, but they were slightly different and had the fine lathing that the seven sound set had. And mm. they were basically to his specification, which I think was part of it was the fine lathing is what he liked. Yeah. Um, and that yeah. was 14 inch high hats, 17 inch thin crash, 18 inch thin crash, and then a 20 inch. It's not labeled a medium ride. They actually don't have names from what I remember. Just 17, 18, 20, and then the 14 inch high hats. But they fall yeah. in line with those weights, I believe. Um, the other thing, too, was is that Joe Morello was actually behind the creation of the flat ride by accident. Wow. He is famously, and it's come up about a bunch of episodes, yeah. he really cares about the sound of things from what i my, my understanding I, I again i can't remember if this was in bill ludwig's book i think it was a bill ludwig's book um they were in switzerland it was probably when they're working out the dorswick deal with with uh, um with joe morello but they were at dinner with with the Pisces brothers and bill bill jr and joe morello and joe had just gotten a watch they were in switzerland he got of course the swiss are known for the chocolate in their watches so back then it was a super low profile watch, very, very thin, which, you know, and they're mechanical, very hard to make. So very yeah. nice watch. And Joe shows them, shows the Pisces brothers the watch, say, hey, can you guys make a symbol like this, this thin? And of course, Robert being Robert, hmm, hmm, let me think about that. So the next day, you know, he went to the factory and he told the guys, don't press a bell on it and then just hammer and lathe it. And 
that was a creation of the flat right. It was basically a joke. And that's yeah. how, yeah. And, and they had a patent on that too. Really quick, I'll just a little appendix on this because we're, we're pretty much, I think we're pretty much through the 602s. Um, okay. I mean, we, we could, obviously people are more familiar with the 70s with the black labels. Um, you know, it really for the longest time, 602s were, were Pisces flagship. You know, they're known for the 2002s, but the 602s were really the flagship for a long, long time. And and I really like them. I, to me, they're very exotic. You know, they're very unique. One of the suggestions I make is go up at least two inches. So in other words, if you've got a 16 and 18 inch uh-huh. Azildjian and, you're, and you want to try, you want to compare it to a 602, I would compare it to an 18 and 20 or even oh, a 19 really? and 20 because... With the increased size, you're dropping the pitch down. You're getting closer in general pitch that you would with the Sabians and Zildjits, right? Because that that's what you're hearing, you know, is that that difference in the alloy production produces that very clear high end. And from the beginning, the I have all these on the wiki, we've got all these Ludwig ads. All these ads say the bright new sound. From day one, Ludwig marketed that sound quality that 602s had. So they knew it, it from the get-go that they sounded different. They were brighter. Yeah. They were a different yeah. sounding symbol. And that is, you know, the European sound. That is, you know. Yeah, which is true. But those those monikers that are put on uh, branding really sticks with things through throughout yeah. the rest of history, good yeah. or bad, which is a whole other yeah. discussion there. But yeah. yeah. I've seen a lot of drummers will... will uh, Nothing with 602s, but they 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 describe 2002s as glassy. 2002s aren't glassy; they're metallic. It's yeah, the that's copper. a good way to put it. 602s are crystalline. They're they're if anything, they're polite. You know, they don't they don't have they don't have the creamy quality like I was saying earlier. They don't yep. have that 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 coffee ice cream that coffee with heavy cream. To me, that's the Zildjian Sabian sound. And six, sure. 602s don't have that. They don't have that. That I mean, the low frequencies are there, but it's more of they have such an accentuated high frequencies that it overshadows those lo- what low frequencies they do have, which are, are there. They're substantial. Real quick, the appendix I was going to add on is the German 602s. Mm-hmm. And I've got, if, oddly enough, it's a Joe Morello symbol. Um, in the 70s, it looks like there were, I've, I've found a few pictures. It's actually from Steve Black as his archive of like a thousand or plus pictures of Pisces is collected from like eBay and all over the place, chat forums. Yeah. And I found at least three or four symbols in there that are definitely German made. They've got the German serial, starts with a one. But more importantly, they have the E over trade stamp, which we know by the time you get to the mid 70s, the 602s, the Swiss made 602s were using what's called the outline stamp. So that's the first giveaway is the serial number because it's a one. And you think, oh, okay, well, it's an 81 symbol. Well, the problem is, is that, and, and Todd Little pointed this out, um, when you look at those numbers, by the time you get an 81, you're into the blue label phase. So that can't be a Swiss made 602 from 81 because it would have been a blue label 602. So it has to be that has to be a German serial. And the, the, the stamp is different. It's using that the archaic E over trade stamp, which is really odd. And the only thing you think of is, is that's what they had at the German factory. They didn't have the modern outline stamp that not will have been used since like 72, 73. I don't really understand why they were producing 602s. Kind of, I bounce this off of Mr. Fritz. I think a lot of it is they were selling in the 70s to say Estonia or Eastern Europe. Or it may have just been for the German market. The, the one thing about the German factory is predominantly, um, and we'll get into the models later, the individual models. Basically, number one, up until recently, I don't think we, we didn't get anything here from the German factory. The German factory was really focused mainly in on Germany, on the German market alone. So it could have been that they're producing a, a small number of 602s only for the German market or for the German market and what they could get in Eastern Europe. Now, remember, 70s, we're talking about the Iron Curtain and the Cold War. So with the exception of a few countries, it would be very hard to export 
across yeah. through the Iron Curtain, I guess the best way to put it. Um, sure. But they are, uh, they are interesting. They are, are unique. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I, to just kind of sum up the, that section, though, would it be, and I know we might have a little more here, but like. Uh, the the collectability of those there's obviously a wide gamut that you can run across sizes and symbols and things but yeah. that seems like things where if you're a player and you're really trying to get some high end top tier symbols 602s are a good investment yes uh, for your collection yeah and, and the, probably the number one thing with them is the fact that they're for the most part in very good condition um, and with age when they age they mellow. And they're they're not as crystalline and bright as is present. They, they're still they're still bright symbols. They still have the top yeah. end. But I from the version the, the symbols that I have, I could I could hear the difference, which I would think would would uh, be even more in line with what drummers were looking for. You know, I guess a more tame yeah. version is the best way to put it. John De Christopher told me, um, and he has a really good point that he won't buy a symbol unless he can hear it, and he really wants to hear the symbol yes. in person. That's what Vincent said on the Zildjian one. Yeah. All of what we're saying about collecting, it comes down to playing it and the sound. And sound files can be manipulated, not in like a really like a uh, nefarious way, but in like a you put a little EQ on it, you put a little top end, you pull a little bottom end. It, it screws with what yeah. the actual sound is. Or you're, so in, you're, you're using yeah. your phone. I mean, that's what I did. I've got a bunch of videos on YouTube. Yeah. But I'm using my phone audio, and it's all compressed. It sounds like crap. Yeah. Um, yeah. A good again, back to big, big JD, back to John, <laughs> um, uh, a, a gentleman drummer, uh, a Mr. Alfredo in Italy, very nice gentleman. I I, I bought uh, um, that 20 inch plane stamp Super Formula 602 from him. Um, he had a, a 16 16 inch E over trade 602. So that's a early 63, 64, maybe 62, and I know. Uh, Big JD's been looking for his uh, Charlie Watts setup. You know, he oh, he yeah. wants he wants that sixteen, and that's the one thing missing. He's got he's got his giant beats. He's got his two thousand two medium. You know, but I know he wants that. Yeah. He he really wants an Arbiter sixteen, which is going to be really hard to find. But yeah, Alfredo had a sixteen inch uh, E over trade six hundred two, and it just was very serendipitous that John was on vacation in Italy in Rome. And I messaged him and I said, hey, I know this guy, Alfredo, and he's selling this symbol and I was going to buy it, but I bought his 20 instead. And he's like, give me his information. And he actually met up wow. with them, had an espresso. The guy brought the symbol with him and John played it <laughs> in the cafe. And he's like, you know what? It's too heavy Man. for me. I, I was looking for, I need something. I want something thinner. But he literally Jeez. was able to yeah, test it in person. That's in, awesome. In that wasn't that long ago. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, Dan, and uh, this has been incredible. So I want to tell everyone, Dan and I have kind of decided that uh, we're two hours into this and there's still a fair amount to go. Your first episodes you did, I believe we hit the 70s where things blew up with modern kind of more rock music and we decided two hours in there, let's do a part two. Yeah. We're pretty much getting into that, you know, 1970s. I know we the, the 602s went into that, but we're getting into giant beats and 2002s and things. Yeah. So things to look forward to for part two is we will talk about the giant beats, the 2002s, the 3000s, the sound creations, vintage lower lines that are worth considering, uh, dark, modern symbols. Dark ride. Oh, yeah, the dark ride. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we will talk about the 602 dark ride. That'll probably be what we start with. Yeah. Uh, U.S. distributors, European distributors, and then also wiki symbol cleaning, uh, supplemental information, and symbol care. I am looking at um, Dan's outline when I'm reading that. I didn't just rattle that off the top of my head. It's like, what is that, like four <laughs> pages, five pages? Yeah. That's crazy. So that's why we're stopping now, because there's so much more to talk about and not just do that. So anyway, all that being said, um, Dan, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge, coming back on for another mega Peisty episode. I know everyone uh, enjoys it who likes Peisty and just symbols in general. So, Dan, until the next time, thank you for being here. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate people spending their time watching this. You know, probably going to get to a point of like, okay, when does he get to the good stuff? <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. It is all the good stuff. Yeah. There's, there's a lot. Yeah. There's a lot. A lot more stuff coming. A lot of a lot of good stuff. The, the meat and potatoes. Got to create the cliffhanger. So yes. Cool. Thank you for being here, Dan. Thank you. I really appreciate it, Bart.